Okay, um, thank you all for coming. I am Denise Pellucci. I am from Dream With Studios, and I like to make it a point to mention at the beginning of all of my talks, my slides will be downloadable. Please don't feel like you have to kill yourself taking notes. Uh, you know, you'll be able to download them all. And the title of my talk is Slytherin 101. So let's talk about Slytherins. House Slytherin, for those of you who don't know Harry Potter, uh, is one of the four houses. They're sort of sorted by personality types. And, uh, you know, I, I can rant at you for like the whole 45 minute talk about how J.K. Rowling relies on, uh, over relies on tropes and uh, makes things a little reductionist and, you know, some whole postmodern critique of Harry Potter, but that's not what we're here for, so I'll save it. Uh, so, let me just Pull the audience here. How many of you are fans of Harry Potter or familiar with Harry Potter? Okay, awesome. Um, so when we talk about Slytherin House, it's one of the, the, the four houses and there are some positive stereotypical traits and negative stereotypical traits in terms of how Slytherin is perceived in popular culture. So let's talk a little bit about the positive traits, the ones that are always mentioned when you think Slytherin. You think uh, people who are cunning, people who are ambitious, uh, people who are very clever. Um, and then this is a, a more recent stereotype and uh, it's actually one of those cases where you can directly trace the influence of a single fan work. Uh, how many people know Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality? Uh, for those of you who don't, it's a uh, fan work being written um, in order to basically um, educate about cognitive biases and rationality through the vehicle of fanfic. It's very entertaining. Uh, so the stereotype of Slytherins as particularly rational has uh, started to come up recently. But of course you can't have positive without negative. Some of the negative traits that people think of uh, Slytherin House, they think of these things. Slytherins are overly complex. Uh, if you know TV tropes, uh, I apologize for mentioning TV tropes if you lose the next, uh, you know, six hours to going over them. Uh, but there's a trope known as the Xanatos Gambit, which is basically, I am going to arrange absolutely everything so it all comes out the way I want it to, except then, you know, you have other people doing the same thing and then all of a sudden you're playing Xanatos speed chess and then uh, things don't go exactly how you want and everybody is uh, trying to manipulate each other and you suddenly find yourself in a 30 Xanatos pile up. Um, there's a whole subset of these tropes and uh, Slytherin House is associated with that kind of overly complex plotting an awful lot. Uh, Slytherins are also uh, often stereotyped as manipulative. And you know, people say manipulative, I say efficient leadership, you know, details, details. Um, but the perception that people have is that uh, someone who is overly Slytherin uh, is gonna be trying to manipulate the world around them to fit into their own particular personal desires. Um, people view Slytherins as self-centered. Uh, people will think of a Slytherin as someone who wants the world to cater to their particular desires, tastes, etc., and not care about other people's feelings or uh, how they feel about the world being manipulated. And by manipulated, I mean arranged properly. And finally, uh, the stereotype of Slytherins as rational, um, I put it in quote marks here because a lot of times people, um, the, the, there's the good side of rational and then there's the bad side of rational. And the bad side of rational of, often comes across as uh, the emotionless robot who is trying to optimize his or her um, personal interaction with the world and personal emotional state. Uh, in order to achieve some sort of uh, fundamental game-winning condition. So I did notice when I uh, uh, pulled the room for how many of you are familiar with Harry Potter that not all of the hands went up. So for those of you who are not as familiar with the Harry Potter house system, um, I, I've taken a couple quotes from two different fanfics in order to give you the sense of the kind of stereotypes that exist for each house. And we start off with a quote from one of my favorite fanfics. It's called Transfigurations by Resonant, and the URL is on the slide. I'll read it for the benefit of the stream. A Gryffindor will jump off a cliff. A Slytherin will punch someone, push someone else off. 
A Hufflepuff will call in 500 other Hufflepuffs and they'll carve a stairway. And a Ravenclaw will get hold of a flying carpet. And then the second quote for the stereotypes uh, is from Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. Uh, smart kids in Ravenclaw, evil kids in Slytherin, wannabe heroes in Gryffindor, and everyone who does the actual work in Hufflepuff. <laughs> so for those of you who are familiar with things, I'd like to just take the temperature of the room a little here. Um, how many people self-identify as members of Gryffindor House or self-identify with Gryffindors? Okay, we've got one. Uh, that's okay. One Gryffindor can take on the entire room. <laughs> Uh, how many people self-identify with Ravenclaw? Why am I not surprised? <laughs> how many people self-identify with Hufflepuff? Okay, okay. I love Hufflepuffs. You're my favorite people in the world. And uh, how many people self-identify with Slytherin? Uh, somebody, several people are pointing at me. Gosh. <laughs> that's a surprise. And not all of them work for you. And not all of them work for me. Yes, that's actually the real surprise. Everybody who works for me knows that. So, you know, I talked a little bit about what the Slytherin stereotypes are, and um, the stereotypes, especially given uh, how reductionist Rowling can be in a couple of places, uh, do come across as Slytherin House as kind of negative. Um, as Slytherin is viewed as the evil, calculating, cack cackling villain an awful lot of the time. But for this talk, I want to reframe it a little, and I want to uh, discuss uh, what I think are um, very Slytherin goals and things that Slytherins want out of the world. And the first thing, of course, is power. There are all kinds of definitions of power. It doesn't matter uh, what community you're in. You're probably going to have a definition of power that doesn't agree with other communities. In social justice work, power means one thing. In uh, uh, sociology, power means another thing. In economics, power means something else. In electrical engineering, power means something really different. But for the context of this talk, uh, when I talk about power, what I'm talking about is having your decisions respected and having the ability to uh, tell people to do something or to accomplish something and have it get done. Second, influence. And influence and power are very closely related. And when I sat down to start thinking about how I was going to define the two different, the, the differences between the two, I finally hit on this distinction. Power is having your outright decisions respected. Influence is having your unspoken wishes respected. And uh, I actually have a really great illustration of the distinction between the two. When we came in uh, to Portland for the conference, uh, one of our team as was going to Costco to pick up some supplies for the hotel room. And she came back from Costco and she said to me, I got you a flat of Diet Coke. I hadn't asked her for the flat of Diet Coke, but anybody who knows me knows that I am a complex black box machine for turning Marlboro Lights and Diet Coke with Lime into textual output. <laughs> uh, so the fact that she thought of me, thought of the Diet Coke, thought, Bringing back the Diet Coke will make Denise happy, so I will do so. That is an example of my influence over her. As it happens, I pointed that out. We were talking about it at dinner uh, the other night. And I pointed out, hey, that's a great example of something I'm going on in my talk. And she said, well, actually, Kat told me to get the flat of Diet Coke for you. So that rearranged things, and now all of a sudden, it was an example of my influence on Kat, because Kat was thinking about my wishes, and then Kat's power over Az, because Kat told Az to do something, and Az did it. So that's the, the, the best distinction that I can think to make there. Third thing that a Slytherin wants is optimization. And uh, how many people in here are familiar with the Perl community, or do Perl programming, or whatever? In the Perl community, Larry Wall, who is the creator of Perl, uh, has identified the three virtues of the programmer as laziness, impatience, and hubris. And these are the things you want to have to be a successful programmer. You know, look up the theory sometime. It's very entertaining. Um, but optimization here, what I'm talking about is Larry's laziness, which is to say you want to exert the minimum amount of effort necessary in order to achieve what you want to achieve and save your energy for achieving other things later. And then finally, a Slytherin values subtlety. 
I apologize that the, some of the slides are kind of low here, but uh, Slytherin values subtlety, which means that um, when people look at you, they see the things that you're accomplishing and the, the goals that you have set for yourself and uh, they see the achievements. They don't see the methods that you use in order to get to those achievements. Uh, subtlety is making it look easy. Subtlety is people not being able to, uh, to see all of the work that you're doing in order to uh, accomplish things. And uh, you might notice that as I'm talking about these goals, there's one thing that all of them have in common, and there's uh, one route to achieve all of these goals, and there's one thing that you cannot actually manifest any of these goals without, and that is people. All of these goals are defined in relationship to the people around you and in relationship to the people you're working with, that you're socializing with. Uh, you can't have power without having somebody to uh, uh, manifest that power. You can't have influence without a community to influence. There's only one problem, and that is that people are complicated. What works with one person is not going to work with another person. And not only are people complicated, but there is no instruction manual. If there was an instruction manual, I really wish that somebody hadn't lost my copy along the way. There are some basic rules, however, and the rules that I'm going to be telling you about here for the remainder of this talk, um, I, I, I'm going to caution you a couple times in here. These things that I am telling you about can sound very manipulative, and I mean manipulative in the bad way there. Um, I personally think that it is possible to use human nature in order to achieve a mutually uh, desirable goal and to uh, get work done most efficiently and most valuably. Um, these techniques can also be used to uh, have horrible, horrible power over people and uh, power horribly abusive uh, dynamics and relationships. Please don't do that. I will know if you do that and I will be very sad. So the basic rules of uh, sort of the uh, human social operating system. Step one is that we are social creatures. Um, you put a bunch of us together in a herd and we are going to try and figure out uh, how we all relate to each other. We're going to try and figure out uh, who belongs with whom. We're going to try and figure out, oh, do I have anything in common with you or you? Um, and not only are we social creatures, um, but social approval is very valuable for us. Uh, we like to feel that we are part of things, and we like to not feel that the, the, the group disapproves. Secondly, our brains lie to us. Our brains lie to us very, very badly. If you go to Wikipedia and look up the list of cognitive biases, it's like this big, and that's only like a surface treatment of these cognitive biases. And there's a whole field of study, cognitive science, uh, applied rationality, uh, et cetera, um, that seeks to study these cognitive biases and flaws in our reasoning. And there's all kinds of theories about, is it because of our neurology? Is it because of our social conditioning? Is it because of our biology, what have you? Uh, it, it doesn't really matter what the ultimate cause is. What you want to know is that um, even when your brain is telling you something is one way, chances are pretty good that it's actually a different way. Third, we fixate on things. How many times have you uh, um, had a project that you're working on, uh, your manager assigns it to you or you adopt it yourself and you decide that your goal is goal A and that in order to get to goal A, you are going to do X, Y, and Z. So you sit down, you get your head down, you start working on X, you, you have a couple of uh, setbacks, you advance through the setbacks, you solve some problems, you finish X, you move on to Y, step, 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 step. And then you get to the end of Z and you look back and you realize that all of that work didn't actually touch goal A in the least. And the reason for that is once we concentrate in on something and once we focus in on a particular decision or a choice or a path, it's really hard to shift ourselves off it because, again, our brains lie to us. And fourth, 
even when we're aware of these bugs in our operating system, even when we know about our brain's tendencies to lie to us and uh, um, about the fact that we can't always trust our input, even once you know about that, it's really hard to overcome them. It is so hard that there are groups that offer entire sets of training on how to, like, th they'll spend an entire weekend on overcoming one particular cognitive bias, and by the end of it, you're still going to be doing the same thing if you're not super ultra careful. So these four things are aspects of human nature that pretty much are not going to change. One other thing that's not going to change no matter what we do is uh, we are vulnerable to cute things. And in this case, I, I, I do mean the cat, not my wife, but I have to think my wife is kind of cute too. But um, Cats, by the way, are the ultimate Slytherins. <laughs> so I, I put the uh, um, cat slide in here because this is actually a great example of cats being Slytherins. Uh, that's Ginny, our new kitten. She has trained Sarah that every morning when Sarah gets out of the shower, uh, Ginny will jump up on her shoulder and settle in, and Sarah will have to complete her morning routine with a cat on her shoulder. <laughs> so again, uh, I'm going to repeat my disclaimer from earlier. Uh, I'm going to now get into a bunch of techniques that you can use in order to uh, take those essential bits of human nature and use them to achieve your goals. Don't be evil. Do not be Voldemort. I will find out if you are Voldemort, and I will be very, very sad. Please don't do it. Seriously, though, um, the purpose that I am teaching you these techniques is so that uh, you can overcome communications difficulties with people and get onto the same page and everybody get moving in the same direction and uh, use these, these techniques for, for good. So the first thing I want to talk about is how um, People tell themselves stories. And if you only take one thing out of this talk, this would be the slide. So you know, if you've tuned out a little, um, tune back in. I'll, I'll let you know in like five minutes you can tune out again. People tell themselves stories. What do I mean by that? Um, everyone has their own personal narrative. You build a framework between you and the world in which uh, you have sort of an archetype or a way of viewing things. Um, some people tell themselves the story of being the, the caring and empathetic one in the group. And they build a, a, a very respectable identity around the fact that uh, they identify as being caring, re reaching out to people, helping people. Um, Sometimes people will, will build their identity as around the concept of always being the smartest person in the room. You know, um, I'm sure we all know someone whose uh, identity and sense of self-worth is wrapped up in the notion that you know, they are their intellect, and their intellect is the, the most important thing about them. I personally, the, the, the story that uh, I usually am living in is the uh, quirky, offbeat entrepreneur story. Uh, some of the time, I uh, take a detour into the uh, plucky, disabled, overcoming adversity story, but it you know, kind of depends on any particular given day. And another thing to know about this is that while people tell themselves stories, they are always the hero of their own stories. You're not going to tell a story in which you, know, you, you are the, um, the sidekick number three, People are very self-focused, which I like to say uh, uh, instead of self-centered, because self-centered has such a, a negative connotation. Um, people are very self-focused. Even when you specifically try to think about other people, um, the minute that you take your mind off of that, you kind of slip back into thinking of everything as how it relates to you. Um, there is a cognitive bias known as the fundamental attribution error. Um, Short, the, the long and the short of it is um, this cognitive bias says that you are more likely to attribute your own failure to accidental mischance, whereas you are more likely to attribute someone else's failure, even if it's identical, to some intrinsic quality of theirs. 
Um, so let's say that you and your coworker both get laid off from work. You're going to think, oh, that was just horrible luck. You know, somebody had it out for me. This wasn't my fault. It was just, uh, you know, bad timing. Um, but you're more likely to think of your coworker, well, you know, he was lazy, and uh, so that's why he got laid off. Uh, that, that's kind of what I mean by that people are the heroes of their own stories. You, you know, it's kind of lonely inside our skulls, and you tell yourself the story in order to keep yourself company. When you're dealing with someone else, it's a lot easier to work with their story instead of against it. Sometimes it takes a little effort to identify what story someone else is living. But if you can identify what story they're living and what they are very invested in believing about themselves, uh, you'll get that they will listen to you a lot more readily if you reinforce that story. So if you know that someone in particular is very invested in believing them, themselves to be the caring, empathic one, you're going to get a lot farther with them by appealing to their sense of empathy than you will by appealing to their sense of rationality or intelligence. Uh, not that the other approaches can't work, but working within someone's story uh, is a lot going to get you a lot farther than contradicting it. It's also important to realize that people's stories can change over time. The story that I was telling about myself a year ago is not the story that I'm telling myself now. It's not the story that I'm going to be telling myself in another two years. And I think it's really common in open source projects, especially projects that have been very, very long running and people who have been working together for a very long time. It's really common for people to slip into the habit of uh, assigning people stories and assigning people roles and then never updating them. Um, a good example of that is when, back when I was still working with LiveJournal, I had an adorable little 15-year-old intern come in and uh, <laughs> I, I raised that boy. I shepherded him through you know, his tumultuous teenage years, and I uh, um, taught him everything that I knew, and then I taught him some things I didn't know, but was able to Google really fast. <laughs> and that was fine at the time. And then I realized at one point, it was eight years later, and he was actually at like C-level um, uh, employment. He was the, the CTO of uh, uh, this company. And, and I was still thinking of him as the 15-year-old the intern kid. So you got to remember, people's stories change over time. And finally, um, sometimes what people do, and uh, the, for those who can't see, sometimes people's stories don't mesh with their actions. And when that happens, believe the story. Um, Sometimes the, the actions that people are performing are at odds with their image of themselves. And uh, when that happens, obviously you want to um, deal with their actions as they happen and react to their actions, um, even if they contradict the, the story that these people believe about themselves. Uh, but treat the story as though it is the truth. If someone is... Um, uh, if someone is invested in believing uh, herself to be the um, uh, emotional, empathetic, caring one, but her actions are saying actually that uh, she's a horrible jerk, y you will get a lot farther with her by appealing back to that story that she's telling and refocusing it on, okay, well, uh, you know, I'm going to interact with you as though you are the empathic, caring one and go from there. And the other really important thing that I have to cover, um, communication styles. I almost made the whole talk about this. Communication styles vary from person to person. They vary from culture to culture. Um, I'm going to guess that 95% of mailing lists and blog flame wars that have happened in the last 20 years happen because there is a massive mismatch between the communication style of the writer and the communication style of the listener. What do I mean by communication styles? Well, there are a couple different examples, and these are just a few examples that uh, came up off the, the top of my head. Um, you can learn more in communications theory um, classes, or books, or uh, Wikipedia actually has some good articles on it. Um, good example, the first one that came to mind was ask culture versus guess culture. 
Um, this is the concept that in, in some cultures it is horribly, horribly rude to directly ask for what you want. Uh, instead that you, you make uh, very oblique hints about what you, you want and it's the burden of your listener to intuit from these hints what you want and provide it to you if they can. Um, actually, no, that's guest culture. I'm sorry, I had it backwards. Guest culture is making oblique hints and the person that uh, um, is listening to you is expected to guess from your hints what you want. Ask culture is uh, sort of a more forthright idea that um, you're allowed to ask for anything. If you want something, you can go up to, you know, I, I can go up and say, hey, Tim, will you do this for me? Um, and conversely, Tim, uh, once he has been asked, it, it's not at all rude for him to say no. This communication clash happens a lot. This communications clash is so serious that um, I, I would estimate that it's probably ruined more romantic relationships than any other issue out there. It's probably ruined more friendships than any other communications mitch style mismatch out there. Um, I come from northern New Jersey. For those who don't know, northern New Jersey is a very strongly ask culture. If I want something, I have no problem whatsoever going up and say, you know, hey, Jamie, will you do this for me? And uh, I don't take it at all uh, as offensive if Jamie says, no, uh, you know, sorry, I, I don't have the time for that. My friend Elise comes from uh, uh, Minnesota. Minnesota <laughs> is an incredibly guest culture. <laughs> Elise thinks that me walking up to her and saying, hey Elise, will you do this for me? She finds that shockingly direct. I think that Elise's habit of saying, well, you know, a body could use a glass of water, um, by which she means, will you go get me a glass of water already? I'm, I'm you know, dying of thirst here. I view that as massively passive aggressive. So this uh, conflict in, in communication style, it took us a long time to work this out. And uh, it, it's a huge, huge thing. Um, another example is uh, direct versus indirect. Someone who will actually, if you want to um, give an opinion or you want uh, uh, to say that something is, is good or bad, you might, one person with the direct communication style might come out and say, um, I, I don't think this is the right direction for us to be going in. Someone with the indirect communication style would come up and say, well, you know, I think it might be time for us to reevaluate the direction of the project and look to make sure that where we're going is still where we want to be. Which, in that communications idiolect, is just as blatant as saying, we're going in the wrong direction. Qualified versus confident. Uh, qualified, well, I think that this is not the best thing for us to be doing right now, but I'm not entirely certain. What do you think? Um, confident is we're going in the wrong direction. Uh, receptive versus absolutist. Um, a receptive communication style is um, when you're stating an outright opinion, um, you add at the end, a solicitation for someone else's thoughts. What do you think? Or let me know if you agree. Or let's talk about this later. Um, and, the, and the remainder of the communication is not assuming that the decision has already been made. Whereas absolutist is saying, you know, we, sh we should do this, or even we're doing this. And the person with that communication style may actually mean we're doing this unless, you know, do you have anything that you want to suggest about it? Because I'm still, I'm still open to ideas, but because of the way they communicate, it comes off as sounding like, no, the decision was made six months ago. There's a whole bunch of these. They are very strongly gendered. They are very strongly classed. They are very strongly regional differential. I talked a bit about New Jersey versus northern Minnesota. Um, particular areas of the country have various uh, communication styles. Um, 
some forms of these communication styles differ between people who speak English as a second language versus people who are native English speakers. Um, there's all kinds of variations in it. I am not saying that one communication style is better than the other. Uh, there's the ones that I am personally more familiar with and the ones that I reach a little further in order to be able to speak. I still don't understand the guest culture. I just, I really don't. But uh, there, there's no value judgment in this. Um, it's more about how we communicate and understanding how other people communicate. Um, and I actually had a conversation with Sumina earlier today um, where she knows that I'm interested in this kind of topic and she said, I'm having this problem and I, you know, I, I have no tools in order to, to deal with this. How can I cope with this communication style mismatch? Um, and I said, I haven't really found a bunch of totally good uh, solutions yet. But once you're able to identify that you, you've got a mismatch between how you communicate and how the person listens, or how the person listens, or how the person communicates and how you listen, a really good thing to do is to just say outright, look, I think we're dealing with a communication style mismatch here. Um, so let's both try to be really con conscious about this and, and uh, work to understand each other. You can, of course, use these communication style differences in order to uh, achieve um, your end goals, which hopefully are not evil. Um, if you want to establish rapport with somebody, if you want to uh, you know, really reach out to people, um, if you can identify their communication style and the way that they speak and the preferences for how they listen, try and match it. You know, maybe if, um, your communication style is more indirect, but you're dealing with somebody who prefers directness. Maybe you know you try and be a little more direct with things. If your uh, communication style is very absolutist and you're dealing with someone who is uh, more of a relative communicator, then you know try and reach out to them and be a little more clear in saying that you you welcome uh, uh, thoughts and this is not absolutely decided yet. If you want to do a social performance of confidence, um, you are in an argument with people and you're feeling that you're being totally bowled over and nobody is listening to you and uh, you have no idea why, um, to perform confidence, get as direct, uh, you know, a, li a little bit more direct. Uh, eliminate things like I think and I feel. Um, eliminate things like maybe um, or if we could or things like that. Um, the more of those little hedge words that you remove and the more qualifiers that you remove, the more people will interpret you as confident. And finally, if you, if you want to perform authority, if you want people to take you as an authority in a particular matter or on a particular topic or while making a particular decision, uh, be as direct as you possibly can. However, this can sometimes backfire. And by backfire, I mean is if you have listeners who uh, come from a more qualified background to whom directness reads as rudeness, uh, you, you can sometimes take it too far and wind up uh, um, really upsetting them. So if you know that the person that you are talking to uh, does not really appreciate the directness, then you know, dial it back some. Next thing you can do in order to uh, really uh, increase your, your influence is build up relationships with people. Um, I want to qualify that this is not the fake kind of relationship. This is not the kind of insurance salesman sleazy, uh, you, know, you know, oh, you know, how are your kids, et cetera, um, in order to make a sale. Um, this is more a tool in order to achieve authentic relationships with people. Um, the first is spend time doing uh, social lubricant. Um, by social lubricant, I mean the little interactions that oil the joints in between us. Um, small talk, uh, as um, Frances was saying in her keynote this morning, small talk is a performativity of, um, I am interested in you. You are a human. <laughs> Let us be humans together. Um, so social lubricant is small talk, expressing uh, interest in people's interests, expressing uh, care in what they're up to, things like that. 
keep track of people as individuals. Everybody likes to feel as though they have this relationship with you. Um, you know, if you're talking to somebody in your community and they just went, to a, went on a vacation, you know, stop and ask them how their vacation was first. Uh, you know, if the more you treat people as individuals and not as uh, you know, uh, interchangeable cogs in the machine, uh, the more that you're going to have that real human connection with them. I, I used to really struggle with this one because I have an absolutely horrible memory for detail and I have a very slight touch of face blindness. So I actually, I, I used to consider it cheating for a really long time. I keep a file of you know, people I know of, oh hey, you know, I wanted to ask him about his vacation. I wanted to ask her about uh, how she's doing with her climbing hobby. And I wanted to make sure that um, his cat got out of the vet and is okay. I eventually came to not think of it as cheating anymore because it, it's really just a form of uh, accessibility um, aid because my memory is crap and I have a slight touch of face blindness. So externalized memory on that one really helps for me. If you, like me, have problems with that, I highly recommend it. And finally, um, you know, if you're going to be doing these sort of uh, social interaction, um, they, they really can come across as fake because we are very, very good as humans at spotting when people are only interested in us because they want something out of us. Um, you know, it's something that a lot of people are very, very sensitive to. And that's why when I say when you're using the, these tips, they, they should come out of actual, genuine interest in people. Uh, you know, you, you should be doing this because your motive is to learn about the people around you and relate to the people around you better and uh, not because you want to place them like tools on your chessboard. That never works. Um, approaching people with authenticity is a lot better than giving them the constructed persona. Um, a lot of tech communities out there have that whole rock star. Um, you know, somebody in your project is the designated rock star, and they have this, this very constructed persona that they show to the world. And sometimes it is the, the, the constructed persona and their actual persona are very similar. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's somebody specifically performing this role because they think it's expected of them or they think it'll get them things. And, uh, you you want to try and avoid that as much as possible because uh, just like people can spot when you're using them for uh, what you want out of them, people can spot when you're being fake and, and putting up this, th this act. Bless you. So if you do enough of this uh, social lubricant and you do enough of um, uh, interacting with people and you do enough about reaching out to people, Sooner or later, you are going to be the person who has the most social connections in your group. And when you are the person who has the most social connections in your group, and when you are the person whom everyone respects, people are going to expect you to mediate in their disputes. It always happens. I'm not sure how. I just keep waking up and discovering that I've got four people going, I'm having this problem with so-and-so. There are a couple of things I've learned here, and these are things that I've learned the very hard way. I am uh, sharing these tips so that you can benefit from my misfortune. The rule one, don't get in between the sides of a conflict if the conflict hasn't stopped yet. If the active screaming is still going on, you know, don't put yourself in between the two sides and uh, you know, jump in and, and try and mediate under fire. Um, the best thing to do is when two people in your community are having that conflict, try and just de-escalate everything by, um, you know, saying that, okay, we will work on this, but for now, let's all just take a deep breath, step back a little. Um, because if you jump in while people are still screaming at each other, they, sooner or later, everybody winds up blaming you. Second, don't side with each person against the other. It's really common for when... Um, You've got, uh, you've got Jane and Tom are having this dispute, and Jane comes to you and she's like, oh my God, do you believe Tom? He's so awful, he's doing this, 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 and this. And you say to Jane, yeah, you know, that really bugs me when Tom does that. I agree with you 100%. And then Tom comes to you and be like, 
you know, Jane is really bugging me because she's doing this, 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 and this, and you say to, to him, yeah, that really bugs me. I agree with you. Even if you do actually agree with both Jane and Tom about the dispute that they're having with each other or, you know, the habits uh, that they're griping about with each other, don't agree with them against the other person. Um, you don't want to take sides. Sooner or later, Jane and Tom are going to um, reconcile, and then they'll find out that you were bad-mouthing the two of them together, or each of them to the other. When somebody comes to you to mediate a dispute, it's really common for them to just want to vent about somebody's behavior that's driving them nuts. So try not to fall into the trap of venting with them. Finally, uh, look for points to empathize which, with the people in the conflict. Um, you know, again, don't fake it. If Tom is doing something and um, you know, he's really upset about this particular thing that's going on, um, it, it's kind of tempting sometimes to say, yeah, you know, that really bugs me too. Or uh, I know exactly how you feel or things like that. That's advice that's often given out in uh, how to build uh, rapport with people uh, type manuals. People can tell when it's fake. I mean, we're very good at spotting inauthenticity. So um, just don't do it. And finally, um, how can you get people to commit to, to doing something? Um, th this is the slide that's uh, kind of the most manipulative. And again, use these techniques sparingly because when they're done uh, for bad purposes, they can be really, really awful. Um, when they're done for good purposes, and for good purposes what I mean is getting everyone, if, if everyone has the same goal and everyone is heading in the same direction, here are ways to um, demonstrate uh, effective leadership and get people to uh, agree to go ahead and move forward with things. First off, people hate saying no to a direct request. Um, if you say to the group as a whole, hey, can somebody please uh, do, do the notes on the wiki for this talk, then everybody will think that somebody else is going to do it. But if I point at somebody in the audience and say, hey, you, will you do the slides uh, for this, this talk on the wiki, people will be more likely uh, to go ahead and do that. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the uh, concept of first responders to a uh, crisis scene. Um, if you are the first person at a crisis scene, if there's an accident that just happened uh, out in front of your house or whatever, and you know a little bit of first aid and you're ready to, to, to rush to the, um, the first aid of someone, but you want to make sure that an ambulance gets called, you don't say, somebody call an ambulance. You point at someone and say, you, you, and you, call an ambulance. And if you, know, you do three people so that somebody is more likely to do it. But if you make eye contact with somebody and you say, you need to do this, they will be more likely to do it. Second, people hate looking bad. Get the commitment in front of the group. Um, and this is something where like a little bit of uh, um, lighthearted shame can work. <laughs> I was kind of a little slow in doing my slides on this talk. So I said to somebody earlier in the week, I am doing the slides to my talk, and if I'm not done with them by you know, tomorrow, I want you to yell at me. That's a self-directed form of getting commitment in front of somebody else. Um, there's a lot of websites out there now that actually use this technique, things like Habit RPG and uh, BeMinder and things like that. Um, that basically allow you to make a public commitment in front of your friends, and then if you don't meet the public commitment, it will laugh at you. Or, or take money, yeah. Um, yeah, BeMinder charges you money if you don't meet your goals. I think it's sadistic. I love it. So if you, want, if you and somebody else in your group, um, if you all agree that something uh, needs to be done, it's best to ask somebody to do it publicly because then the, the pressure of the, the, the socialness and the herd animal um, uh, will motivate them more to get it done. And finally, give somebody something or do them a favor before you ask them to do something. This one's evil. I mean, it can be flat out evil. Creating the sense of obligation in somebody um, and then asking them for the favor 
Um, it's actually something that has even a, a chapter in Gavin De Becker's uh, book, The Gift of Fear. It is a very common technique for um, domestic abuse and et cetera. But it doesn't have to be evil. <laughs> um, if you are looking to get somebody to uh, be sort of more predisposed towards doing things that uh, will benefit the whole project or whatever, uh, it is helpful to give them something or uh, you know, compliment them, point out something that they do particularly well, and then ask them to do it for the project. Um, as you are so good at writing user documentation, will you come and do this thing? OK. Uh, um, it is a, a technique that uh, you want to deploy sparingly, because if you're doing it all the time, people will start thinking that you're a manipulative bastard. Bless you. And you don't want that. Um, you don't want to be a manipulative bastard. But it can be helpful. <laughs> all right, I just spent 45 minutes telling you how to be a manipulative bastard. More like uh, you don't want people to think you're a manipulative bastard. So we're going to take some questions if you want. Um, this is because it is uh, obligatory for every presentation to have a picture of the cat. This is our cat, Ginny, who is the most Slytherin cat we have ever owned. And uh, the link up here, slideshare.net slash dreamwith, is where these slides are going to be. Um, they are not there yet, but they will be by later tonight. Um, and I will take questions. Yes. What do you do if you ask somebody their cat, spouse, et cetera, is, and it turns out they're dead? You apologize <laughs> heartfeltly. You basically, you, you know, you do anything, the same thing you do when you have the, any social faux pas is you apologize, and uh, then you, you see if they want to talk about it. Um, I spend a lot of time, um, uh, Sumina likes to joke that I am the social sysadmin of my team. Um, because I spend a lot of time just listening to people like talk about their problems and sometimes it really does help people to, to talk about things. Um, obviously I'm not saying that everybody should go out there and be unpaid grief counselors but you know if it turns out that uh, um, you know I, I ask Sarah oh how's your cat and she said, my cat's dead you know you just say I'm sorry is there anything I can do? Anybody else? You talked a lot about matching using like, communication styles with people, mm -hmm. which makes kind of a lot of sense. Um, you know, suggestions for how to be effective at doing that when you are, are an extreme, you need your, your, your personal communication style is, is somewhat extreme. On that side or the other. Suggestions for matching communication style when your personal communication style is to the extreme on one end or the other. Um, this is something that has helped me personally, is actually role playing. Um, not necessarily role playing scenarios of a um, particular, um, uh, like, okay, let's role play talking about this bug or whatever, uh, but role playing in terms of like uh, dice and, uh, you know, D&D &D type role playing because it lets you put yourself into other personas and lets you explore a little bit with uh, you know, playing a role. Um, getting into the role play mindset, sometimes when I sit down with somebody whose uh, communication style is vastly different than me, I'll be like, okay, I'm going to role play as someone who has this native communication style. Um, finding somebody that you know and trust who has that communication style natively and asking them to be your beta reader. Um, if I know that I'm talking to somebody who is very, very strongly from a guest culture, I am so very strongly from an ask culture. So I come across to people from guest culture as being, uh, you know, very arrogant and very overbearing. And I am kind of arrogant and overbearing, but I try not to be too much so. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Um, so if I know that I'm talking to somebody who has a very strong guest culture background, I will go to one of my friends who comes from a guest culture and say, hey, can you read this email for me? Because I'm dealing with somebody who comes from a guest culture. I want to make sure that this doesn't come across as like too arrogant to you. 
Um, those two things are, the, are, are pretty much the, the ones that I use most often. Um, aside from that, it's just uh, being very mindful about how you are speaking to people. Um, sit on the email for 20 minutes before you send it, that kind of thing. One more question. Okay. Heidi? So what do you do when being direct is directly punished because you're not performing your duty correctly? Oh, what do you do when being direct gets punished because you're not performing your gender correctly? This happens to me all the time. I haven't figured out yet. If I do, I'll let you know. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Um, no, it is, uh, as I said on that slide, communication styles are very, very heavily gendered. They're very heavily classed. Um, the way that people of, uh, women are socialized to be more indirect. Women are socialized to soften their language and add those qualifiers. And I did, I decided consciously two or three years ago that I was done with that and that I was going to eliminate all of these qualifiers, eliminate all of this indirectness, eliminate all of this I think and maybe. And I have you know, had people come down on me for um, being too arrogant, for being too uptight, um, for being too bitchy, which is my favorite because uh, you know, bitchy, if you see it uh, directed against uh, someone, especially a woman, but also against guys, bitchy always means you are performing your gender incorrectly. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have an answer to that one. I, I, I kind of just take the hit points when they come and deal with the aftermath later because I have decided that I don't want to interact with people who think that being direct is uh, going to be the cause of gender pleasing. If you figure it out, let me know, please. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for coming and listening. I'd love to talk to people about this afterwards. I should be around tomorrow uh, during the unconference day for at least a bit. Um, if I didn't get to your question, I would love to uh, talk about it in the hallway or something. And thank you very much.